Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized U.S. dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Angela McArdle, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you. Um, I originally reached out to you through the Twitter profile at LP National. I um, was just wanting to talk to someone from the Libertarian Party, and you were the honored guest that was recommended. Uh, and just by way of quick introduction, you are the chair of the National Libertarian Party in the United States. Um, and your Twitter handle, which is separate from the other one is at Angela for LNC chair. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation. I thought we could start with what sounds like a really interesting origin story <laughs> for your involvement in the libertarian party, which was this hostile takeover you described. Uh, so what, what is that all about? Yeah, so I am a member of the Mises Caucus, and we are a caucus within the Libertarian Party that is really focused on Austrian economics, obviously. We're not attached to the Mises Institute, but it's obviously very near and dear to our hearts. We focus very much on um, decentralization. We like to talk about fiat currency, inflation, all of that good stuff. We have a very heavy emphasis on local elections and issue coalitions. And we were really unhappy with the direction of the party over the last 10 years. It seemed to be drifting to the left, not just culturally, but also also policy wise, mm. which I didn't think was really good. And I don't I don't mean in a libertarian, you know, live and let live, be OK with gay marriage thing. I mean, like not speak out against lockdowns kind of stuff. Mm. So. I've technically I've been in the party actually since before the caucus existed, but once it popped up in 2017, I was like, this is really for me. Like all of my grievances with the party are really being addressed by this caucus. We need to get back on track to just being libertarians hmm. instead of trying to pander to the left. So it took about five years of organizing, but we did organize. We outgrew the uh, status quo within the party and convention by convention, we started to gain a larger, uh, a larger membership. You know, we were twenty percent of the membership the first time, and then forty percent, and then this last time we were a little over sixty percent. Uh, so, wow. um, <clears throat> yeah, we we took it over at our national convention in Reno in May. Wow. So it's 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 just like the two other main parties when it comes to delegates and conventions, right? So you got to work it bit by bit 
50 state conventions, every single state convention, you got to get a majority of delegates. And that's what we did. That's interesting. So what do you, okay, I guess first, the original meaning of the term libertarian, as I understand it, uh, reading authors like Mises and other Austrian economists, libertarian philosophers is uh, someone who's advocating for low to no government essentially. Right. Or as, as little yeah. statism as possible. Um, but that seems to have changed a bit, especially prior to this takeover event. So what, what changed? How did it, how did it drift from this, uh, kind of advocacy for low to no government into whatever it was, uh, I guess when, when you became involved? I think that as time marches on, you, you have two sort of issues, right? Which is, you know, political problems in the country and the the way that the wind blows. And then you mm. also have a lot of dysfunction within the organization. Mm. Uh, it was not it was not managed very well. And this is just from a technical technical perspective, right? Like finance, uh, political strategy, marketing. Uh, what are we doing? How do things work? How does how does the staff work together? Boardroom culture. How does the board interact with the staff? Who's driving the train? All of these things were really chaotic and disorganized. And at the same time, you have like really rapidly changing culture in the United States. And what happened was an opportunity opened up for other people to come in and do a takeover. So this happens in all mm. kinds of organizations. Mm -hmm. So someone else comes and does a takeover and things start to go more towards the left. At first, mm -hmm. there's sort of a centristy kind of kind of neocon version of the Libertarian Party, right? Like, oh, let's not speak out against the war in Iraq. Oh, let's not do this. Oh, let's play it safe. And then it started to veer to the left when playing it safe also meant veering to the left. Mm. And why not welcome in new leadership from a devil's advocate point of view? Why not welcome in new leadership and trust them to make the right decisions when everything is so chaotic and dysfunctional? Hmm. And so that's kind of what happened. Um, it's really unfortunate. So I don't think that the definition of the libertarian changed in anyone's eyes, but the behavior certainly changed and what mm. became an acceptable and standard practice started to drift quite a bit. Yeah, that makes sense because I, my interpretation of pure libertarianism would be almost someone that's apolitical in a way, right? Yeah, like you're just absolutely focused on life, liberty, ensuring life, liberty, and property, and then that being the extent of government, right? Nothing, no governance beyond that, essentially. But even uh, that has become hyper politicized now, right? right? Like if you say you're apolitical, you might as well be, you know, waving a Nazi flag to some people. <laughs> they think, oh, you you don't agree with me, you know, like mm. yes, you must so, be worshiping Hitler, right? So why is that? Why? Ha I guess maybe let me frame the question like this: To what extent is this cultural change we're seeing in the United States? Uh, we're seeing it abroad as well, but I guess we'll just focus on the U.S. To what extent is that cultural change towards leftism or wokeism? To what extent in your mind is that a consequence of social engineering or some intentional um, push versus something that's just emergent and natural? I think it's a little bit of both, honestly. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that fair to say? I think it's course, a little yeah. bit of both. Let me think about that. I think there's a, a several factors at play. Let's think about that. So I think there's there's an interplay between several things. I think that you've got sort of you've got boots on the ground activism, and you've got central planning from the top, almost at, at a global level. And there's a mm -hmm. little bit of a feedback loop in between, which is sort of like politics and culture mm -hmm. have a feedback loop as well. I mm -hmm. think that. Politics are downstream of culture. Agreed. But once that's been going for so long, they you know they sort of get a little bit of a feedback loop element. Mm -hmm. And I think that what most people would refer to as wokeism is really mainstream Marxism, mm -hmm. and it's a form of tyrannical tribalism. It's disseminated through culture and politics in a very opportunistic way by World Economic Forum types mm -hmm. who want to push things like social credit scores and ESG. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think it's an ideology and a tool, and it's a means to two different ends. Uh, so for on the ground activists, that end is just ruthless egalitarianism. Mm-hmm. But for higher ups pushing ESG, people at the WEF, uh, that end is like a cavernous disparity between themselves and everyone else, the mm. rest of us. Mm. And I think that um, I think that so, some of these things like wokeism just sort of pop up, you know, like Marxism is already out there. It's floating. Mm. And people at the top see people getting kind of riled up and they're like, oh, this is a really great tool for me to use to push my agenda. And so there becomes a a feedback feedback loop between the two. And then you have, Mm. you know, conservatives on the other hand, just trying to play catch up. Mm. Yeah, no, it's brilliantly put. Uh, I like that framing of wokeism as mainstream Marxism. Um, It very much rhymes with a lot of the assertions Marxists were making in the 20th century. Um, What, so and this mainstream Marxism is obviously antithetical to true libertarianism because the, the central aim or a central aim, I would, I think the central aim of Marxism is to abolish private property, right. And usher in this, this communist utopia. And obviously libertarianism is the precise opposite, right? That the stronger private property is, uh, the more civilized we become more peaceful, prosperous, et cetera. Um, have you, I've found this particular notion of property being so indispensable to civilization as I think, I think Mises said something to that effect, right? If, if history has taught us anything, it's that private property and civilization are inexorably bound. You kind of, you can't have one without the other. I found that idea very difficult to communicate to people, yeah. to, to laymen. Absolutely. How do you wrestle with that? Um, especially given all of the emotionally charged uh, positions and assertions that are being made by, by people on the left or, or wokest. I think it's very challenging, but not impossible to convey some of these things. So when you get down to really basic things, you know, like owning what's in your house, not your house, but what's in your house, most Mm -hmm. everyone agrees with that. But then when we get into arguments about property and then it's really clouded by things like inflation and government intervention. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to, what we have to artfully point out to people. Mm -hmm. And so the best way to do this, I've found is to take a, you know, like a very principled libertarian argument and you have to wrap in an emotional appeal. You have to use Mm -hmm. object lessons and stories that people understand government forcing someone out of their home due to imminent domain. Uh, Mm. the more brutal and tragic the story, usually the better people understand it. Mm. Um, The pain point, of course, is when you have people on the left who think, well, we just need better people in charge, and then there won't be abuse of private property rights. And obviously, Mm. we know know better that's not the case. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point that um, I guess there is this, maybe it's a prehistoric notion where we always think we could just find a better leader, a better person to put in charge rather than looking at the incentive structure itself. Yes. And I think, I think I was just going to say that's more fundamental in my mind. Yeah. And I think that part of this is some, somewhat, some of us have an inability or just a really strong aversion to contending with, with human nature. Mm-hmm. And so some of the people who believe the best things about human nature and its aspirations and what it could become end up with the absolute worst designs because mm-hmm. they keep thinking you can get a better person in there. And, and I, I just have to say with humility, we cannot like that. It doesn't mean mm-hmm. that humanity's doomed and that it's, you know, horrible and that we should, you know, obliterate ourselves, but there is no person who is ever going to be good enough to run everyone's life. You know, there is no yes. person who can decide who all should own what. This just, it's not a good way to run things. Absolutely. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? We've, yeah. <laughs> Lord Acton told us that a long time ago. Um, and it seems like that that old adage, hope for the best, plan for the worst, is kind of the right design guidance, right? That yes. We want to create systems where exploitation, corruption, 
violation of private property, these things are difficult or risky or expensive somehow. Yes. That's how you properly um, create a socioeconomic system, frankly, right? It has to be, it has to start with the incentives in in my view. Yeah. I think we have to balance it, right? What Mm -hmm. is the, Ooh, I don't like the word fair because fair often means like what I think is best for me Mm -hmm. and, and, and best for you on a secondary basis. But what is a system that allows people to, to work, you know, on a merit-based system and fulfill their best selves while also not violating anyone else's rights. So you can work, you can work to achieve your, your highest potential as long as you're not actively hurting someone or screwing them over. And I think that that is property rights. Yes. It's capitalism, but it's also property rights. Yes. Now, brilliantly said the universally applicable rules right. That we all, that can find all of our behavior. And so then that allows, if you, in a world where private property can't be violated, right. I'm free to pursue my own self-interest up to the point of other people's self-interest, right. I can't cross that line. And that seems to be, that's, that's the ideal, obviously hard to create that in the real world, but that's the ideal towards which we should strive. Right. Uh, While recognizing that we're never going to reach a true ideal, right? Yes. We're going to get as close as we can without right. explicitly screwing someone else over. Now, do you, this is another one that I've struggled to get people to see my view on is that the debasement of fiat currency is a violation of private property rights that you're actually mm-hmm. you're violating the property rights of dollar savers when you produce Absolutely. new units of dollars um have you encountered similar resistance to that oh definitely i think that people really just don't understand how the, the dollar works and it's mm. incredibly frustrating when the explanations for this get kind of crowded out by arguments about greed when we're mm-hmm. talking about inflation and, and corporations and, and, you know, there's all this propaganda yeah. against it. But generally I think it's, you know, like inflation hurts our, our money. It hurts our money, like mm-hmm. our money, not just the United States, like what is sitting in my bank account, in yes. my sock drawer, whatever it, it, it damages our purchasing power, our goods, our savings, everything that we own diminishes in value every time more currency is printed. Mm -hmm. That's how I explain it to people. You know, like your can of beans was worth 89 cents. And now um, six months later, it's a dollar and 18 cents. That Mm -hmm. seems unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, That's a tricky one too. I guess people just... There's the illusion. It's almost like an optical illusion because when you see nominal prices going up, especially if you're an asset holder, you own real estate, stocks, whatever, Mm -hmm. you just think, you only think one layer deep, like, oh, the number of dollars in this basket of goods or portfolio is going up. So therefore I'm better off. But that hides the diminishment of purchasing power per dollar. And somehow that simple optical illusion has been so incredibly successful across history. Yeah. Um, And it's very difficult to combat, I guess, with logic because people, I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a reasoned argument and it's not as obvious as the nominal price of goods and assets going up. And then you get all kinds of things clouding it like, like modern monetary theory, which Mm -hmm. is like the failed, it's like the failed witchcraft of fiat policy, yes. um, you know, and people are trying to tell you inflation is good. You're going to yeah. make more money. I haven't seen that happen yet. Yes. Yeah. It's very frustrating uh, to talk about. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it. Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> and I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> 
So with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. So tell me about, you mentioned earlier that you deal with some issue coalitions. I'm not even sure exactly what that is. And then you also have been dealing with tribalism, I guess, in regards to yeah. political activism or parties. Um, what, what specifically, I guess, what coalitions and or tribes are you actually dealing with in your your position at the libertarian party well i run the third largest political party which means that we are not one of the top two largest political parties so mm -hmm. we are not part of their club you know mm -hmm. and what we learned over the past um midterm election cycle was a was a painful lesson that tribalism is is people are like hyper tribalized right now Mm. And they they believe that there is so much at stake. It's like they can't of they can't afford to step outside of their inner circle, and that it was really challenging for a lot of our candidates who were not adequately equipped and prepared for all of this. And you know, as an aside, that's just something that I inherited in my position. Mm. Generally speaking, you you need to start prepping for midterm elections a year and a half in advance, and if that work isn't done, there's nothing you can do when you slide in. To, to power like four or five months before the election. Hmm. But uh, it was it was challenging. And, and you see that tribalism bleed into almost every aspect of life now. Entertainment is hyper-politicized. Hmm. You see you know, people get kicked off of social media platforms for sharing the wrong political opinion. You know, we had, there was a, a takeover at Twitter based on this particular issue. Uh, even diet is politicized. So now hmm. you've got, you know, generally speaking, if you if you're vegan, then you're left wing. If you're carnivore diet, then you're you're right wing. It's like mm. you can't <laughs> you can't escape it. You know. Um, so instead of just banging my head against a wall and saying we're never going to break in, I thought what I've really got to do is is work with it because tribalism is unavoidable, mm. and so I don't want to try to work against human nature. Um, 
I have to find overlapping areas of agreement between different tribes. Mm -hmm. Tribal groups don't exist in isolation. It's more like it's more like Venn diagrams. Mm -hmm. There's overlap. And so you have to find those little areas of overlap between yourself and someone else. And the more you have in common with, with other people, the more you can adapt, I think, to a tribalistic environment and move through it. Obviously, it also helps to have a high degree of openness, mm -hmm. like from the from the Jordan Peterson perspective. Mm -hmm. When you're highly disagreeable and you're highly closed off, you're going to have a tough time in a highly tribalistic environment. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I've been able to find areas of agreement with people on the left, specifically like the, the anti-war left or the, the dissident left, people who are still staunchly uh, in favor of free speech. This is These are not your typical Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, the the older, the legacy of the anti-war left that was around during the, the uh, George Bush Jr. administration. And we've gone, you know, we've gone in on uh, working on a huge anti-war protest in D.C. on February 19th, because we're all very opposed to the United States being involved in the war between Ukraine and Russia. And mm -hmm. we, we're not real happy about billions of dollars being sent overseas especially when inflation is so high, people are feeling the effects of it during the holidays too. It seems mm -hmm. like a real slap in the face. Yeah. And so I've been able to, to make coalitions like that and make friends, you know, and then you find, Oh, lo and behold, you have more in common. And maybe the only thing you disagree about is economics. Mm. And then when that happens, what I try to do is I try to shift our dialogues from policy-based uh, perspectives to values oriented perspective. Mm -hmm. So we don't agree, right? Like I hate fiat currency. Mm. I want to, I, I think we should just abandon the dollar and everyone should move to Bitcoin as much as possible. Mm. Uh, I don't think that you can get the right person in charge. I don't want universal healthcare. I don't want government healthcare. Mm. But what I do want is I want everybody to flourish and thrive. Mm. I want people to have the opportunity to be healthy and well and get, get healthcare when they need it. And people on the left want that too. They, mm -hmm. m most of them, there's a handful of really angry people who don't want us to have healthcare, right? They don't like mm -hmm. us, <laughs> <laughs> but most sane people, they're like, I do want people to do well and to be healthy and happy. And so we just have to shift our conversations to that level. And when we do that, we're usually able to work past any disagreements we have, or at least just kind of set them to the side and be like, that's okay. You know, we'll triage our problems, right? We're worried yeah. about nuclear war right now. We'll we'll argue about economics after after we all feel like we're out of the like danger zone. Yes, no, that's that's great. Uh, we definitely, yeah, you have to unify under common value systems ultimately because, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just not you can't just legislate human action, right? People are going to follow right. incentives rather than laws, and uh, it seems like that common value fabric at least points people in the same direction. I mean, that's, that's an, a, a principal value. I would argue that religion has provided historically, right. And get everyone kind of pointed yes. the same direction under a common value system. Um, so let me, I'm going to drill into something here. So you said earlier, and I agree with this politics is downstream from culture. I would further argue, don't know if you agree or not with this, that culture is actually downstream from economics. Um, so when I see this excess of political polarity in the world, um, I'm looking at fiat currency debasement, widening the wealth gap. Uh, you know, this is one of the core means by which the rich get richer, the poor get poorer is through currency debasement. And so this, it's the debasement of fiat currencies and creating this economic polarity that then becomes a cultural polarity that then becomes a political polarity. And it seems like if we could get central banking out of the equation or fiat currency out of the equation, that maybe I'm not saying this would fix political divisiveness or polarity, but I, I, it distinctly seems to me like the past couple of years have not been some kind of natural phenomena. It's right. there, there's a, there's a, um, an institutional element to this that's, that's exacerbating political polarity. And so I just, I would just like to hear your thoughts on that. If you think these things are connected, uh, you know, economics, politics, culture, and, and if so, how. Okay. Let me think about this in the context 
of what I was saying earlier about wokeism in the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. I think inflation is a means to World Economic Forum ends, Mm. and it's a more sophisticated tool than war. still has brutal consequences. And I feel like there's a connection between inflation, wokeism, and central planning. Mm. I feel like maybe there's a little bit of a feedback loop here. Maybe some of this is interchangeable, but let's feel it out. That when central governments inflate and debase currency, people get angry when Mm -hmm. they have less purchasing power. And then they figure out or they attach themselves to some sort of reaction And this has been egalitarianism Mm -hmm. and it is manifested in a very ugly way, which is they're not going after the people at the top. They're going after the middle class. They're going after white people. They're going after men. Mm -hmm. They're going after now, you know, gay men because they're now um, just as bad as the regular straight (laughs) white male. Um, They're not seeing what's really happening, but they have a sense, a general sense that something's wrong. And then the world economic forum can be like, Oh, good. Great. They they didn't catch on to us. Uh, Keep pushing that wokeism. Let's keep pushing that and keep distracting them that way. I think that inflation is like a, is a, is a tool, is a tool to, um, to get people exactly where elites for lack of a better term, Mm. you know, where elites want us all to be. I prefer the term parasites for the elites. Parasites. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Wealthy parasites. Yes. Yeah. Wealthy from parasitism, actually, right? Yeah. Not productive people. These are people that have taxed and debased currency um, to, to create, not to create, to steal wealth, actually. Yeah. Um, people always people like to think of people on welfare as as you know parasitic and i think oh well okay you know they're technically leeching off tax dollars but it like pales in comparison to yeah. the people at the very top of the food chain yeah and that that's a pernicious thing too because the people on welfare are those being dispossessed in the wealth hierarchy yeah. as a result totally. of inflation so it's like they're the victim they're most victimized in this scheme. So I don't think it's fair to call them. I mean, although you're technically right, right? Like the tax dollars that are being stolen are then partially being redirected towards paying for food stamps or welfare, whatever it may be. It's not like those people have concocted the scheme by which they benefit. They are the victims in the scheme ultimately. Oh yeah. No one aims to be on welfare, right? No one, you know, graduates college and is like, I'm going (laughs) I'm going to try to be on welfare one for for a living. There's no so. promotion on welfare. Yes. There's exactly. no there's no promotions. You're you're never worth more than whatever it is, $900 a month or whatever yeah. like that you you never you never get to like achieve your potential. It's, exactly. it's a really horrible place to be. Yeah, yeah, and I just don't think it's fair to lump in welfare recipients with the WEF parasites. I mean, they're just two different categories yeah. of, of people really. Um, okay. So you mentioned that you've made some strides toward uh, the libertarian party's relationship with the Bitcoin community. I'd love to hear about that because I really think it's, a match made in heaven, more or less. Like Bitcoin is yeah. the ultimate libertarian technology. Um, what has your experience been uh, relating to the Bitcoin community? Well, we've been signaling and messaging about Bitcoin from our social media outlets. In July, we did a big um, we did a big live stream with some of the big voices from Bitcoin on it, which was really great. You know, we had Safe Dean on. And we've just been trying to educate the population on it and really talk about it from a libertarian perspective about currency. Mm. And so I'm I'm very optimistic about that. We're going to continue that. Uh, Bitcoin Magazine did a story featuring me a few months ago. 
So it's it's really good. I yeah. mean, it should be right because libertarians don't believe in central planning, mm-hmm. and we obviously hate the Federal Reserve. So that's I can't think of a relationship that would be better than that. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Uh, I'm I'm really excited to hear that too because the Bitcoin and this has been this is something Eric Weinstein said to me during our series together that the Bitcoin community kind of needed to grow up and step into some of these positions, you know, inside of institutions yeah. or, or political hierarchies to take action, right? It's not enough to just save in Bitcoin and wait for everything to change. You actually need to take some action to create the world you want to see. Um, so really happy that those two worlds are coming together. Um, okay. This is strange for me to even say, but somehow freedom, liberty, and individualism have all become dirty words in this hyper-politicized environment that we've been in lately. What happened? How, what, how has language become so twisted? Uh, is, is this part of the WEF social engineering scheme? Is this just general confusion of terms? Like what's going on where to say, Hey, I support individual freedom is now somehow this far right political statement. How did we get to this point? I do think there's definitely social engineering at play here. I think most of it's opportunistic. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a group of like, you know, like a council of five that sits down and plans the the entire world. There is literally a world economic forum going on right now, but I still don't think it works that way because I think there's just competing powers and competing interests. Yes. But uh, I think that there have been a handful of circumstances that have popped up over the last, let's see, eight years or so that have really pushed people apart and have unfortunately vilified words that I hold near and dear to my heart. Mm. Uh, Donald Trump's election was definitely one of them Mm. because those are words that are associated with his campaign. Whether or not he gets to own them, like that's just, that's not how language works. You mm-hmm. know, it's kind of memetics. It, it goes where it goes and things take off and have a life of their own. The lockdowns in 2020, again, just like really, really reiterated that. I'd, I'd say Donald Trump's election in 2016 is where it really started. The great mm. meme wars, mm. which were which were lots of fun on social media, but the fallout, <laughs> you know, now you've got people withholding their grandchildren from their parents because of who they voted for and right. because someone had the, had the word patriot on their social media. Um, I think these are just opportunities that people in positions of power use and they push it and it catches on in academia with people who, who align with those people in higher positions of power, academia and media, and it just pushes it and pushes it and it, it becomes like an avalanche, you know, it's almost right. impossible to stop. Yeah, it's well said. I- it's just struck me that, you know, the individual is the ultimate minority, effectively. Mm-hmm. So these well-intentioned leftists, right, that really want to see people flourish and do well, or or they want to see minorities maybe, you know, be given the leg up in, in some, some form. It's like, why, instead of thinking at the, the resolution of race or ethnicity or some other group category, why don't we just think at the highest resolution, which is the individual, right? That is the ultimate minority in the world. And, you know, as libertarians, I guess this is kind of our position. The more you create a socioeconomic system that caters to the preferences of the individual, the better the collective is. Um, I don't know. It just seems like some... <laughs> I guess what what would be the criticism that's launched at us? Idealism, I suppose, but but this doesn't seem to be idealism to me. It's like you can create things that are centered on individual preferences. You don't need to think in class consciousness necessarily. Um, but that too seems to be a hard idea to get across. Yeah, and it cuts both ways, right? I mean, I think that as disparity as perceived disparity grows and it's whole, and it's so unfortunate, right? Because we have seen uh, so many people lifted out of poverty in the past, mm-hmm. what, 
50, 60 years yeah. all over the world due to capitalism and countries mm-hmm. adopting more capitalistic views, mm-hmm. free markets opening up. Like, And, and the what we define as poverty in the United States is nowhere near what we would have defined it as 100 years ago. Yeah. We have people who are living on state assistance comfortably in studio apartments and they have Netflix and a cell phone mm-hmm. and they get food. Yeah. Like they eat nice meals every meal. That's, that's incredible. That makes me so happy. Mm. But I think that in spite of that, well, you have no historical knowledge of it. We have very bad public schools. People don't understand where they've come from, you mm. know, what the country has been through over the past hundred, 200 years. And, and you have this vein of ravenous envy mm. and, it's really hard to let go of collectivism when it's, mm. you know, dangling all these like false incentives in your face and, and jump out and grab individualism when it doesn't come with the same fancy lies. Right. I think it takes a lot of courage to, to let go of collectivism after you've been fed a bunch of lies and try to embrace individualism. Yeah, it really does. Uh, it's so tempting, right? From each according to their ability to each according to their need. Or if we could just tax the billionaires, then we could fix all the, like, it's so, right. I guess it's much easier from a collectivist standpoint to just vilify an individual or individuals and say, these are the bad guys. We're the good guys. Yeah. Versus thinking through the actual economics of private property and individualism right. it's like it's all that theory is the core there's challenge. no practice there's yeah. no practice it's all theory which is why so many people who are rampant collectivists stay in academia because yeah you don't have to practice it you can just talk about theory all day long right. you don't see a lot of hardcore collectivists who are entrepreneurs yeah that's that's no so that's true. coincidence right and one would think we, you know, the theory was put to the test in the 20th century, collectivist versus yeah. capitalist economies. The outcome was abundantly clear. Yet here we are again with this infection of mainstream Marxism, uh, suggesting the abolition of private property is somehow a, a panacea or a path forward. And I, there's just not a single example historically of that, nor is there any theoretical justification for it really, other than this, this failed theory of, of Marxism. You will uh, own nothing and be happy. <laughs> that's the, that's the phrase. Yeah. That one really shocked me to see that. It was, it was shocking. I mean, that's a yeah. summary of it, but the article title said something like it's the year, whatever. I don't own any private property or have any privacy and I've never been happier. I, that's there's a reason that there's so much dystopian science fiction literature centered around that because yeah. it is a very unhappy state of being. Absolutely. Happy. And that is what we must fight against, right? Just spreading the good word yes. and hopefully living, being living examples of libertarian philosophy. Just yeah, it's it's challenging. I mean, it's it's, it's tempting to just be angry about it all the time mm-hmm. and scream about it on social media and complain about it and cut yourself off from people who disagree. But one of the things that I really like about the Bitcoin community, and it's something that the Libertarian Party needs to adopt, is that there's a lot more optimism mm. and there's a lot less negativity. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is one of the best ways to attract people. Yes. Yeah. Beautifully said. The the bright orange future with Bitcoin is a very attractive ideal to work towards, right? Again, even if we can't achieve it fully, it yep. puts us in a much better position than we're in today. So I think that's, that's well said. Angela, thank you so much for joining me. Um, really enjoyed this conversation. Where can people find you on the internet? Thanks for having me on. If you want to read more about the kind of things that I'm talking about here, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Angela McArdle. You can also find me on Substack and Locals. And then if you're interested in the Libertarian Party, please visit lp.org. Wonderful. Thank you so much.